Calloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Calloway. Greetings to the 984,000 people who watched the mother of all talk shows over the last seven days. I know, I know, it's so close. Let me say a million next week, please. Greetings to those raging against the war machine in Washington, D.C. right now, probably including rather a significant number of our viewers. Hope they watch on Catch Up. Greetings to all those who will be rallying against NATO and against war in London, in central London, next Saturday on 25th of February. Greetings to a wonderful lineup of guests. The Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador. The Dr. George Samuli, the Central and Eastern European expert, talking about the latest threats from the United States against its ally, Hungary. And greetings to a young man walking in my own footsteps, maybe even a future presenter when I'm gone, of the mother of all talk shows, the one and only Donald Korta. We'll be talking about Russia, about Ukraine, about the United States, about Palestine, East Palestine, Ohio, that is, the scene of one of the greatest man-made catastrophes in American domestic history. And we'll be talking about Scotland, the dramatic, abrupt, unexpected departure of the leader of the SNP Green Coalition and predicting that that coalition will not last the week, at least according to the commentator Ian McWhorter writing in The Spectator in the last hour. So, as you can see, we'll be touring the horizon almost as if we were up there in a, I don't know, a weather balloon or something. Oh my God, what was that that just went past? A $475,000 Sidewinder fired by a billion dollar F-22 fighter jet. But don't worry, it missed. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night, as Betty Davis once said, because... Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Nothing screams to the demented dysfunctionality of the United States and its empire, and I include its vassal states in Europe, than the spectacles to which we have been treated, if that's the word, over the course of the last seven days. The demented press conference in which President Joe Biden, almost certainly in the advanced stages of Alzheimer's, shrugged give me a break to reporters who were baying at him to confirm or otherwise that the United States had, with the aid of an F-22 firing three Sidewinder missiles, two of which missed, had shot down a hobby club $12 balloon. That's right, not a weather balloon, not even a Super Bowl blimp, a $12 hobby club balloon that went missing on the day that Joe Biden scrambled the U.S. Air Force to shoot it down. He couldn't answer, of course, as to what was happening, and Larry Johnson actually exclusively revealed to us last week on the show exactly what had happened. The White House had so berated the commanders at NORAD and the United States Air Force, that they decided, far from being caught out again by a wayward Chinese weather balloon, they would shoot down anything that moved or looked like the moon. Thank God they missed the moon, but they didn't miss every little balloon that every hobby club in the United States had sent up. At a cost, therefore, of millions of dollars, they cleared the skies of every blimp 
in the skies above the United States of America. It was a morality tale. This is, after all, the armed forces that were whipped by goat herders on bicycles carrying 40-year-old Kalashnikovs and wearing open-toed sandals in Afghanistan just a year or so ago. But they could make light work of your hobby club's balloon. And then you can compare and contrast the environmental catastrophe that has struck Palestine. Not the Palestine in the Middle East this time, East Palestine in the great state of Ohio in the United States of America itself. Where railway track is so dysfunctional, bent, buckled and broken like much of the infrastructure of the United States itself. In microcosm, it is the United States, a great industrial state gone bad, gone rotten. The catastrophe which took place at East Palestine was noteworthy for several reasons. First of all, noteworthy that it had not happened before. In fact, it's astounding that any train carrying anything potentially hazardous ever makes it across the state of Ohio without this kind of disaster ensuing. Anyone who's seen the video and the pictures of the twisted, bent and broken rails will know what I am talking about. But it was significant for two other reasons. First of all, it showed the entire mainstream media machine moving into action in defense of the corporate interests threatened by the environmental catastrophe now devastating millions of people in that state and the Ohio River itself from which fully one-third of the people of the United States draw their drinking water which is now so poisoned that fish are being washed up in their thousands, many miles from the epicenter of the disaster. But the corporate media not just went into overdrive in order to suppress the story in the beginning, to pretend that it actually had never happened, when that, thanks to social media, became impossible, they are now drowning the population of America with propaganda that that big giant mushroom toxic cloud hanging over the town is entirely harmless that these fish would have died anyway that the wildlife and domestic farm life which is dying in front of the eyes of their owners and those with a camera to see is really just nothing to worry about but the third and most damaging and significant aspect was that those citizen journalists who in those first hours and days were bringing us the news from East Palestine began to be arrested by the local arms of the United States government. The police, the FBI, began arresting journalists who reported on this environmental catastrophe making it the nadir or the high point, depending on your point of view, of the extent to which the media is now an arm of the empire, naked, unashamed, unembarrassed, and ready to pick up their checks and their profits from their investments in the railway company, apart from anything else. Every major newspaper and television group in the United States has shares in the train company whose crash brought about this catastrophe. If ever there was a fusion of state and corporate power, it was demonstrated over the East Palestine disaster movie this week. Now, what do we call a fusion of state and corporate power? Well, I'll leave you to look that up for yourself. The dysfunctionality of being able to shoot down $12 hobby club balloons, but unable to repair the railways, the bridges, the roads, 
the motorways, the highways, the freeways of the United States, the rotten, crumbling infrastructure and superstructure of the United States is a case in point. As was the fact that a country that is telling everyone else what to do, how to live, how to organize their society, this week suffered and it's not over yet three mass shootings in a single week the latest in a town in alabama that none of us had ever heard of in which six seven eight who knows people were killed in a car park and a dozen or so were maimed the week began with a mass shooting on a campus that I myself have spoken at in Michigan. Michigan State University suffered a mass shooting at the beginning of the week. It's already forgotten about, overtaken by events, although two Chinese students, amongst others, were amongst those murdered in that mass shooting. It's not even the end of February and the United States has suffered 73 mass shootings. Now, I'm not getting into the issue of guns or no guns. Frankly, if I was an American, I wouldn't be giving up my guns in the sea of criminality from the government downwards of the United States. I'm not getting, this is not an anti-gun rant. It's my point that the United States is so dysfunctional, you can't go to the mall or the school or the university or the nightclub or the cinema without a very significant possibility that you will be shot down by automatic gunfire wielded by a maniac taking their cue from the maniac government of the United States, which shoots on sight everywhere else in the world. Why shouldn't the people in a shopping mall or a university campus in Michigan do the same? A state founded on the annihilation of tens of millions of the original inhabitants of the country and then buttressed by the enslavement of hundreds of millions of Africans. Why would it be surprising that such a state was a state of such dysfunctionality? I mean them no harm. I just want them to stay at home and fix house. After all, isn't it abundantly clear the problems that they've got? But are they doing that? No. Joe Biden, the aforementioned Alzheimer's patient, went on television this week to promise not just the $120 billion, billion dollars of military aid that he has given to Ukraine and that's in the pipeline to Ukraine. He went on television to say that he had given more money to Ukraine to pay for their pensions and their social security so that, and I quote, they have something in their pocket. So he's paying for things in Ukraine that American people don't have. He's using American tax dollars to give citizens in a foreign country benefits that his own people don't have. As Jimmy Dore said, we should change our name to Ukraine and then maybe we can enjoy some of Joe Biden's largesse. The people of East Palestine asked for FEMA assistance, federal emergency assistance. If that's not an emergency, what is? FEMA turned them down. If only the big guy, whoever he is, had gotten his 10%, maybe things would have been different. And Samantha Powers, the angel of death descended briefly last week in Hungary this time. You know when she arrives that trouble is not far behind. So what was she doing 
in Hungary, well, she helpfully told us in a press briefing that she was there to assist democracy in Hungary, a country which has free elections, which happens to elect time after time a leader that the other European Union bosses and their bosses in Washington don't like. Too independent, too anti-Brussels, too anti-Washington, and thought to be too sympathetic to Moscow. So they sent Samantha Powers. What was she planning to improve democracy and human rights in a European Union member state, a NATO member state? Well, again, she helpfully told us she was there to disburse money and orders to non-government organizations in Hungary. What I call Trojan horses. I say to the Hungarian people, beware Samantha Powers bearing gifts. She has no good intentions for you. She wants to topple your government and replace it with a government more to the liking of the government in Washington than its vassals in Europe. Speaking of which, I greet the huge demonstration of German people in Munich over the last couple of days, demonstrating outside the so-called security conference, which would have been better named the Insecurity Conference. Maybe 50, maybe 100,000 Germans rallied there against their government's de-industrialization, which has caused now a wave of strikes across Germany, against their government's pathetic, only word for it, pathetic obeisance to Washington, which has reached the level that when Washington blows up Germany's own infrastructure and it is proved in great detail they cannot even open the zip that they willfully put across their own mouths to complain. And the rising in Germany and in France are both pregnant with great Harbingers of change on the European mainland, not something which we in Britain can claim is at any time likely. But there is a war, a new war inside the British political system. It's not a war between opposition and government because they are the same thing, two cheeks of the same backside. It's not a war based on ideology. It's a war in the Conservative Party, newly declared by the overthrown leader of the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson, and his usurper, the diminutive dwarfish, Rishi Sunak, or for American viewers, Rashid Sanuk. And that war is about putting Boris Johnson back in charge. Not that you could slip sixpence between the two cheeks of that particular arse, because you could not. They stand for exactly the same things, at home and abroad, just that one says jump, the other one says jump higher. Boris Johnson, on the visit of Zelensky to Parliament, demanded that Britain send its entire Royal Air Force to Zelensky and to the Ukrainian armed forces, where, of course, it would quickly have been extinguished, like a b weather balloon. It would have been burst. Our whole Royal Air Force, Boris Johnson, wants to give to Zelensky, leaving us, of course, without an Air Force at all. But then, to put that in perspective, the entire British armed forces, army, navy, and air force, all of them could fit inside Aston Villa's football ground in Birmingham, Villa Park. So don't expect much if we give you. 
our entire Air Force. After all, when Zelensky asked for more planes from Britain, an unnamed member of the British cabinet who may or may not have been Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, said, we haven't got any effing planes to give to Zelensky. Whoever it was, they were telling the truth. We have an aircraft carrier which for a long time had no planes on it, which set sail from Portsmouth after breaking down in the harbour, before breaking down again in the Isle of Wight. 11 minutes sailing time away. Our Trident submarines are in part held together by super glue. I'm not making that up. That's what the sailors told everyone. Our armed forces can be sent to the South China Sea, the Straits of Taiwan, to the Pacific, to menace China. The armed forces can be sent to the Polish border to menace refugees massing in Belarusia, but they cannot under any circumstances, stop the 65,000 people crossing the English Channel in rubber dinghies, almost all of them men, almost all of them fighting age men, to be sent then to three and four star hotels for infinity, perhaps, at the British taxpayers' expense. We can defend everybody except ourselves. We'll defend anyone's interests except our own. That's the dysfunctionality of the vassals and the empire that the vassals serve. And I hope to adduce from my next guest some expert testimony in that regard. I'll be right back. This is the mother of all talk shows. Mr. President, we got a report of a 50-foot woman marauding through Washington, sir. Thank you, Captain. But I'm looking for a shorter woman, one who likes to take long strolls in the park and yell at minorities. She's not looking for a date. She's terrorizing the city. Is there a difference? <laughs> a little levity. Call in the military. <clears throat> we are the military, sir. Boy, we got here fast. We better do something, right? Shall I scramble the jets, Mr. President? No thanks, I'll just take a muffin and some coffee. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, if you want to comment on anything I said or didn't say or anything my guests say or don't say, you can call the show. And a record number of people did in the last two shows, breaking the record both times. If you're in the UK or Ireland, the number is 0808196552. That's 0808196552. It won't cost you anything at all. Ditto if you're in the United States or Canada where it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Toll free. And if you're in the rest of the world, the number to dial is four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Now George Samuli, Dr. George Samuli, is senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and is the author of the wonderful work, Bombs for Peace, NATO's Humanitarian War on Yugoslavia, a subject very close to my own heart. And he joins us now. Dr. George, thanks for uh, coming back on the mother of all talk shows. Mm -hmm. My eye was caught by Samantha Powers in Budapest. What good could come out of that visit? Well, no good whatsoever. And you summed it up uh, superbly. I mean, she's she comes in with $20 million, which 
in a small country such as Hungary can uh, carry you a long way. And what is she doing? Well, the Hungarian people have failed NATO, they have failed the European Union, so it's time to buy another. And what she's doing is, of course, buying up uh, cadres, uh, buying up uh, manpower that can be unleashed at a particular moment. These are known as the color revolutions. Should there be an election that can be disputed or any uh, a strike or any kind of a social problem, these people can be mobilized at a moment's notice. So that's what she's there for. And of course, when, when you start off with 20 million, you can be sure that there's another few 20 million dollar handouts along the way. Yeah, 20 million is the declared amount, uh, but uh, I'd be surprised if there weren't another few 20 millions under the uh, the table. How has that gone down in Hungary? I mean, uh, Trojan horses have their place, but they are generally opposed by the local population. What's the attitude of uh, Orban, the Prime Minister, and what's the attitude of the public to this U.S. interference in their political affairs? Well, Hungary, as uh, many countries, is somewhat bifurcated. You have the capital, um, which is the center of opposition to uh, Viktor Orban, and then you have the rest of the country, which is uh, very strongly pro-Orban. So in the last election, Orban carried everything overwhelmingly, with the exception of Budapest, in which he lost every single uh, district quite uh, comfortably. So, uh, when somebody like um, Samantha Power comes to Budapest, she will find uh, you know, ready takers, and you always find ready takers for money. I mean, if there's a, a free trip to uh, the United States involved, um, excellent meals, excellent uh, hotel stays, sure, you're going to find lots of people uh, on board. Um, but in the, for the rest of the country, they are obviously very, very uh, wary of her. And of course, they're very wary of um, the kind of evil genius behind all of this, which is uh, the uh, Hungarian uh, George Soros. Yes, I was going to move on to him. Uh, it's a double whammy. You've got uh, Samantha uh, with the uh, right hand and George Soros with the left. Uh, just... What is it about the Hungarian government that these people hate so much? Well, Orban has um, really said what needed to be said by somebody within this uh, NATO land, which is that this war um, is an absolute disaster for uh, Europeans in particular. And uh, it's uh, NATO, which is supposed to provide uh, security for um, its members, is providing anything but security. So yesterday in um, his uh, State of the Nation address for Hungarian Parliament, Orban has probably gone as far as he has ever in questioning the value of NATO membership and EU membership uh, in the European Union. Keep in mind, Orban was the prime minister back in March 1999 when Hungary signed the accession treaty to NATO. So it's kind of personal for him. And this happened 12 days before uh, the bombing of uh, Yugoslavia. And he has pretty much said, this is supposed to be a defensive alliance. We are not supposed to be uh, getting involved in wars outside of the zone. And of course, he knows. I mean, you know, Hungary was involved in that war against uh, Yugoslavia back in 99, but he was young and naive then. But now he's saying, look, I mean, what we're doing in Ukraine is you know, really provoking a war with Russia. This is not a conflict that has anything to do with us. Uh, it should have been resolved a long time ago. It hasn't been. And it's leading to a catastrophe. I mean, and he's pretty much saying, I mean, <laughs> really questioning the value of this uh, uh, alliance for Hungary. He has, a, as it were, a national axe to grind with Ukraine, and relations between Hungary and Ukraine are uh, steeply declining. This is because of the presence of a significant number of uh, ethnic Hungarians inside uh, Ukraine. Tell us how that came to pass and what precisely 
are the problems? Well, it came to pass when um, the uh, after the end of World War One, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, disintegrated, and um, you know through the Treaty of Trianon, large chunks of the Kingdom of Hungary were allocated to neighboring states. So we had uh, Transylvania, which is really very close to Hungarians' hearts. It was assigned to Romania. We had Vojvodina was assigned to uh, Serbia. And then we had this uh, Transnistria, what's called Transnistria, was this, this uh, Carpathian. It was initially assigned to uh, Czechoslovakia, but then uh, during the wartime conferences, it was decided by Stalin that it would be assigned to the USSR, and so it became a part of uh, Ukraine. So this uh, piece of Ukraine is inhabited by Hungarians. Now, this nationalistic, xenophobic, racist uh, regime that took power in uh, Kiev in 2014 has been uh, stamping out all non-Ukrainian national manifestations. Obviously, it uh, banned uh, you know, uses of uh, Russian language uh, in the uh, east and southeast of Ukraine, but it's been doing the same thing to other national minorities. And so the Hungarians of Transnistria have been coming under increasing repression. They can't uh, carry out their education in the Hungarian language. And then all the kind of symbolisms of Hungary have been uh, destroyed. I mean, they've, they've at attacked all, the, all kinds of monuments. Um, and so they're facing uh, uh, cultural repression. And again, it puts Hungary in a very difficult position because officially Orban is uh, sticking to the EU line, which is condemnation of Russia. We must support Ukraine. Ukraine is the victim of aggression. He sticks to that line. But then he says, yeah, but look what they're doing to our own people, you know, the Hungarian minority. So he's he's really in a in a bind. So why why is he supposedly sticking up for Ukraine when it's actually doing something that is damaging real serious Hungarian national interest? Let's move west, doctor, for a minute. Uh, Germany being uh, in a way the epicenter of the European problem now on the principle that Germany was by far and away the biggest, most powerful economy. It has spent decades as a king of the European heap uh, and is now becoming a different kind of heap. And the people appear to be beginning to uh, revolt against it. Uh, what's your take on how stable the current political line in Germany is? Because it's under attack, not just from the left, but also increasingly from the right. No, there's no question. I mean, I think the, the uh, opposition to uh, NATO EU policy, particularly on uh, the war, is um, coming from the parties of the right, which is the alternative for Deutschland party. And then, of course, the party of the left, which is Die Linke. Um, the political establishment um, in Germany is absolutely within the uh, NATO camp. Um, the German industrialists, on the other hand, are a little different because they've seen that, you know, how do you make money? You make money by doing uh, good business with Russia. The uh, cheap uh, Russia is a source of uh, energy. It has been since the 1970s when uh, Germany began to sign uh, you know, natural gas um, agreements with the uh, Soviet Union. It's been the, uh, an absolutely essential ingredient to German economic success. And the industrialists don't see, make, don't understand why uh, the, the political class has destroyed this very, very pleasant uh, relationship that they had with uh, Russia. So. They don't like where it's going, but the political class in Germany has been uh, uh, entirely captured by the Atlanticists. And uh, the most uh, sinister figure there is Annalena Baerbock, the uh, foreign minister. She's a member of the Green Party. She's extremely ambitious. Um, she obviously despises um, the Chancellor Olaf Scholz. 
understandably and she has her eye on uh, on the top prize i think she would like to be uh, chancellor the americans don't trust uh, uh, olaf scholz they've never trusted the social democrats going all the way back to the early 1950s they absolutely loathed willy brandt didn't particularly like helmut schmidt so they they're just never happy with uh, social democrats and they would like to see a coalition between the christian democrats and the greens and i think annalena baerbock would be uh, the ideal candidate to be uh you know chancellor and then she, or you know she continues foreign minister without being undercut by uh schultz now the german public however is not signed on at all because according to the opinion polls uh most germans wouldn't even uh want to defend nato member states they would be opposed to invocation of article 5 uh you know which is they're supposed to come to the aid of uh, any uh, nato member under attack they don't even want to do that let alone do anything for ukraine so this whole thing is being entirely driven by a political elite completely out of touch with the, the wishes of the German people. But as Annalena Baerbock said, I really don't give a damn what German people think. I'm just going to go on uh, pursuing my policy on Ukraine. I mean, she actually said that. Annalena is, of course, a mathematics uh, genius. Uh, she called on Putin <laughs> to make a 360 degree turn, uh, which would, of course, leave him facing exactly the same way. That's right. That's, yeah, that, that, she's a little uh, mathematically challenged, um, and, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, we, you know, Europe is now full of these strange political leaders. They, they kind of pop up out of nowhere. Um, you know, they're kind of nice looking. They don't have too many ideas about anything. They don't really understand very much, um, but they're kind of hoisted uh, to the top um because they know how to read the script they know what they're supposed to do and say so we have the um the the, the finnish uh leader the fin chick the um who the work hard party hard girl who's pushing finland uh into uh nato and making sure that there'll be no referendum uh in finland you have the same type of person in sweden uh estonia i mean you know europe is now taken over by these people which means that they they have no political base anywhere they you know they they've not risen through the ranks they've not done any of the political work they're just hoisted into power because they look good and they know how to read a script and what about finally doctor uh, the depth charge of the Seymour Hersh revelations uh, about Nord Stream 2 uh, to, there's five top media platforms in Germany, at least for the first few days, it may have changed, but for the first few days, not one of them reported a single word about what the Western world's most eminent journalists had written about their country and the attack on their infrastructure. Yeah, that's right. But interestingly, again, the uh, the German mainstream media immediately went into attack mode against uh, Seymour Hirsch, uh, you know, saying, oh, you know, he's a discredited person, uh, you know, well past his prime. So they, they, of course, do the ritual thing. Oh, well, he used to do good work, you know, back then. Yes, yes, he did. It was very good. Milai, yes, yes, first-rate work. Um, yeah, CIA spying on the uh, American public. Yeah, ab 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 absolutely great. Yeah, Abu Ghraib. Yeah, good, good. But now this is all nonsense. It's a little like when they say about Julian Assange. Yeah, yeah, he, he did some good work. You know, when you know he he disclosed the the video of the uh, Reuters journalist being killed. But everything else he did is is absolutely terrible. Um, but that, they've been attacking. Um, uh hirsch however i think it's seeping into the public i mean the public is aware of uh what what hirsch uh, disclosed and it reinforces all of their suspicions against the americans i mean the Amer the germans have wanted the americans to leave ever since 1991. i mean they, 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 they don't see any reason whatsoever for an american presence in germany but 
you know, you know, in, in Germany, you just don't get a look in if you're just a, uh, an ordinary, you know, Hans Hansen uh, in uh, on the public. You know, it's the, the the political elite who stick with this whole, uh, you know, NATO. We've got to be part of NATO. So, unfortunately, I think the, the public so far hasn't been able to make the uh, the kind of impact that they should be able to make. Well, wait till they see Moats Berlin coming from London. They won't know what has hit them. Dr. George Samueli, thank you for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Now, let me take a quick break, and I think we're taking some of your calls. Stay tuned. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens! said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Let's go first to David in Swindon. What would you like to say, David? Um, I really want to talk about the um, Munich Security Conference. Yeah? Go ahead. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's an ironical name anyway, isn't it? McCune Munich Security Conference. Who made that up? But basically, two of the um, people <laughs> who were speaking there... Mr. Chamberlain? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. The one that's going on there with Kamala Harris speaking. <laughs> She actually said yesterday, yes. and I quote, and I had to watch it twice, in our judgment, Russia has committed a war crime invading Ukraine. Crimes well, against that's, that's, humanity. Yeah. That's what she says. I, 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 I quote from In our judgment, Russia has committed war crimes in invading Ukraine. Well, that's good from a country that's invaded nearly 51 countries, Vietnam, Agent Orange, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iraq. Um, you couldn't make it up, could you, really? <laughs> you couldn't. Uh, you know, uh, in Russia, if you go around grinning all the time, people imagine that you must be an idiot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in America, they make them vice president. Uh, yeah. I have yeah. never seen that woman other than grinning, uh, except when she's giggling, uh, yeah. despite the seriousness of the topic she's addressing. Yeah. But she you said you, at yeah, sorry. that... Yeah. Yeah, that we have formally, formally now, we have they formally did it, I don't know. We have formally concluded that Russia is guilty of crimes against humanity in, uh, in Ukraine. This from a country which, as you say, has committed more crimes against humanity than any other country in the world, bar none, and which is still committing crimes against humanity in various places, at least the victims of their earlier crimes are still suffering and dying over it. But she delivers this with this inane grin that makes you wonder if she's an imbecile. She can't see just how stupid it looks for an American leader to be accusing other people of committing war crimes. Last word to you, Dave. Yeah, no, I was going to say, which leads me on to Anthony Blinken. Did you see him speak? He's got such righteous <laughs> indignation. 
No, no. He, um, he's right. got such righteous right. indi- indignation, he actually is condemning China for supplying drones, and they may even supply other armaments. Oh, dear. You know, what right have they got to say what China well, can and again, can't supply? When, when, just let me finish. Well, uh, when, yes. when the USA supplies every year to Israel $3 billion of aid, $3 billion, that's not $3 million, and I loved your thing a few weeks ago about million and billion, you know, 12, 12 days of seconds and 32 years of seconds is a billion. Yeah. Every year, the U.S. gives Israel yeah. $3 billion. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, Sorry, uh, it is, no, it is American exceptionalism writ large. And it would appear, let, let's assume they're not all knaves, some of them merely fools that they see no contradiction in them giving unlimited weapons to whomsoever they like and other countries giving weapons to whomsoever they like, even when it's commercial, even when it's business. You know, Iran is supplying drones to the Russian armed forces for money, not for love, but for money. It's business. America's business is business. And of course, they are the world's biggest arms trader. And yet, they don't see the contradiction in that. They don't see the contradiction of accusing other people of war crimes when in this century, never mind in the last century, you have committed war crimes almost without number. David and Swindon, thanks for the call. I'm going to Florida next. Who wouldn't? Where Simon wants to talk about Ukraine. Go ahead, Simon. By the way, this is Simon from Florida. And I'm very glad that you've been paying some attention to the Munich Security Conference. And whilst I understand that it's very easy to mock some of these um, less than smart politicians and generally um, disregard the value of their statements, there were actually some very, very important policy statements during the conference. And it's worth listeners remembering that when these people are surrounded by friends, as you've seen at Davos and recently at the World Government Summit, they often say the most extraordinary things as if they were literally in their club or in their study at their home and not being filmed. So to that end, you have to um, please try and appreciate that during the panel discussion between the foreign ministers of the United States and Germany and Ukraine, all three of them actually called for regime change in Russia, despite President Macron the previous day having said that every attempt at that in the previous 20 years had been a disaster and he repudiated it. So that was the context of Ms. Bayerbrock's comment about Putin needing to change his thinking 360 degrees. That was the condition that she was imposing upon him in order for him to be allowed to remain in office as president of the Russian Federation. Then you had the foreign minister of Ukraine say not only did he want 100% of Ukraine territorial lands returned, he wanted full reparation and he wanted a new government in Russia. And then you had the American Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, then saying that Mr. Putin should understand that he was going to face the um, severest consequences that were imaginable, that was even either to be taken as a removal from office or a death threat like they used to threaten Saddam Hussein with. So it, these were in the same conference that Ms. Bayerbrock said that on the 24th of February, her entire political outlook had changed, bearing in mind she's the foreign minister of, of, of Germany, and that she now believes strongly that Germany should, um, from henceforth, deliver weapons into conflict zones that they had always um, um, refused to do. And then straight after that conversation, we had an extraordinary speech from the new German defense minister, Boris Pistorius, 
who said that not only must Ukraine win, but that Germany was going to do away with the policy that it had had since 1945 of never sending German soldiers to countries that had been occupied by Nazi forces. He then announced a huge expansion in the German defense budget and said that Germany would be sending a brigade of infantry to Lithuania as an example of doing away with their no German soldiers in previous occupied lands. So there was some incredibly important statements that that the media really overlooked. uh, Go on. I was, I was putting out these comments live on Twitter on my handle, Simon from Florida, trying to get the media, and I do actually do research for several radio stations in the United States, begging them to, to cover these comments and understand that there was a very, very large number of American politicians at this conference. And the theme for the whole conference that people can read on the website, which is Security Conference dot org and then hidden in the top left hand corner there's a menu button then you can see all the pre-conference reports and all their special publications and the theme of the conference was zeiten vendor which means the watershed moment and then the um following on from the admonitions in the daily telegraph during the week the german defense minister said that not only was germany going to expand its activities beyond the boundaries of NATO, but they were looking now to engage even in the Indo-Pacific following the British example that was called for by um, Elizabeth Truss when she was foreign secretary at her Mansion House speech that you may remember, and has now been reinforced at the same conference by Mr. James Cleverley the British current foreign secretary, though you've had a good few number of them, who's also saying that Britain is going to expand not only in commerce, but also in defense matters in the Indo-Pacific, which is all about the containment of China. Well, I'll tell you what, Simon, uh, that's not just the best call of the night so far. It's the best call of many a night. We should have you on as a guest. Thank you for making it. Some uh, excellent YouTube comments coming in. Uh, Sharp Turns says, this is a difficult question because I'm not sure we know the answer. I suspect Nord Stream is a more serious environmental disaster, yet we'll probably see more real world damage to people with that disaster in East Palestine. This is a reference to the poll that we've got running on my Twitter, on my YouTube, on my Telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway, and on the YouTube uh, community, my goodness, 10,000 people have already voted, and I haven't even told you what the poll is yet. It is, which is the bigger environmental disaster, East Palestine, Ohio, or Nord Stream 2? And it's very close, actually. On Twitter, 48% for East Palestine, 54% for Nord Stream. On YouTube, 41% East Palestine, 59% for Nord Stream. On Telegram, 47% for Ohio, 53% for the Nord Stream. And on the YouTube community poll, 46% for Ohio, 52% for for Nord Stream. That's a very, very close and big poll. Get your vote in uh, before the end of the show. James Harnden says the Ohio event is going to render 100,000 square miles of farmland poisoned for several years. Just your everyday train crash. Kent Prince says, George, I have to ask, with all these environmental and natural disasters happening, where the hell is Greta Thunberg and all the environmental activist groups? Kent, that's a question I myself have been asking. Where is Greta on the American bombing of the Nord Stream 2? Where are Extinction Rebellion uh, on the Nord Stream 2 bombing? Why don't we hear from them? Because their activism is directed at putting working class people out of work, of keeping working class people cold in their houses, of opposing 
economic growth which working class people require in order to better their standard of living. You will never see these groups challenging the power which perhaps is behind their campaigns in the first place. Guni, 1972, uh, says something, but I can't quite read it yet. Uh, so get your votes in on the poll and get your comments coming in. Uh, Guni, 1972, says, I can listen to Kamala, but only until she opens her mouth. I must say, I know that she's a woman, I know that she's a woman of colour and that a certain circumspection uh, must, uh, out of decorum, be uh, respected uh, or, or, or practised. But I think she's an imbecile. The more I've heard her speak and watched her speak, I actually think she's an imbecile. I mean, literally, a simpleton, simple Simon, or whatever the female equivalent would be. John is on the line uh, from Berwick upon Tweed, which for foreign viewers is a beautiful little town which nestles between England and Scotland and has changed hands many a time. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Right, what I would like to discuss here is, on a daily basis, I look at the photograph I've got of my dad and his brother in their naval uniform that they served in the Second World War. Right? And I, I look at it with pride. But when I look at our yep. British political parties, surely they're not going to stand at the Cenotaph next year as a, a sign of respect for the fallen against the Nazis. When we are now supporting them with money and military, well, they surely will, John, as I suspect you know. Uh, their faces uh, ever more waxed with grief, their poppies ever larger, uh, their uh, never again pronunciamento uh, more fake sincere uh, than they were last year or the decade uh, before that. The presence well, well, of Tony well, Blair be celebrating the Senator. I've shown the respect for the fallen in Ukraine. I wouldn't be surprised if they, well, they included won't. them. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, if, if Putin was really the madman that they say he is, he'd already have dropped uh, Russia's first nuclear weapon down the chimney at Downing Street because Rishi Sunak, effectively declared war on Russia just the other day when he boasted that Britain would be the first country to supply the Ukrainian military with long-range weapons that even the Americans will not give them. And of course, what long-range weapons mean is weapons that will land in Russia and kill Russians. Well, so far... Uh, Britain declared war on Russia, but Russia never declared war on Britain. But you've got to wonder, John, how much further the Russians will put up with all of this. Last word to you. Well, all I can say is that Russia will win this, and deservedly so, and stop Nazism from coming over the border. Well, be proud uh, of your father and uncle. I'm I proud am. of both of my grandfathers who fought under Montgomery in the 8th Army all the way from El Alamein to Monte Cassino and beyond. My uh, maternal grandfather, uh, sorry, my paternal grandfather was wounded at Dunkirk and had a metal plate in his head for the rest of his life. I'm very proud of them. I would have, if I'd been alive, been at the recruitment office in 1939. Indeed, I would have been demanding a war against Mussolini and Hitler in 1936 when they began the bombardment of the Spanish Republic in the Spanish Civil War. I ain't no pacifist, and neither are you, John. We just don't believe in fighting other countries' wars, I'm fighting unjust 
wars, fighting wars that make us less, not more, secure. That's the difference, John, between you and me and these hypocrites. Their faces waxed with grief every November at the Cenotaph in Whitehall in London. Now, in the second half, we have two cracking guests. We've got Donald Corter, who's a political analyst and host of The Revolution Report and director of a wonderful film called Eight Years Before. And after him, we've got the Honorable Craig Murray, former British ambassador to Uzbekistan, sacked by a Labour government for, and I quote from his dismissal letter, over-focusing on human rights. It's all coming up right after this. Stay tuned. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. That's my favorite jingle, and I understand it's Donald Trump's favorite jingle, too. Uh, my best friends, of course, are on Patreon. Many of you are my friends, but my Patreon followers are my very best friends. Uh, one of whom, Michael Scott, says the USA has never admired Europe, and they don't care if Europe is devastated by war or famine. For 70 years, there's been a broad peace by agreement between different European nations, something to be admired. Nazification has been rising, a consequence of capitalism. The young don't realize. USA will sacrifice peace in Europe for its own world dominance. They don't care. And my dear, dear friend, Teresa Kelly, says, Dearest GC, uh, GG, finally getting around to listen to the latest mother of all talk shows. I'm currently dealing, she says, with lots of sibling struggles. I won't probe too far into that, Teresa. Your timing in touching my aching heart by reading my comments to your audience, audience could not have been a more beautiful gift. Thank you, and as always, may God bless you endlessly. Thank you, dear Teresa. Donald Corta is an American in Moscow. That would make him interesting uh, in itself. But he's a terrific journalist, a great broadcaster, and one day, who knows, maybe my successor, here on the mother of all talk shows. Donald, welcome uh, back to the show. I wanted, uh, if uh, you will, how your take on how these endless pronunciamento from Munich that we just heard in a call, where people are setting down conditions uh, in foreign countries, the foreign minister of Germany is laying out a set of conditions in which the president of Russia will be allowed to continue as president of Russia. A set of pronunciamento in London about the uh, supply of long-range weapons which can land in Russia and kill Russians. Do people pay attention much there to this mindless babble, uh, these dogs barking as the caravan moves on, or do they just brush it off their shoulder? Well, first of all, I want to thank you again, George, for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure. Um, about how Russians kind of uh, consider this stuff, I mean, you could talk to um, two different parts of the population, essentially. I mean, obviously, we know the majority of the population here supports Russia's special military operation. They support the government's actions uh, in Donbass and in Ukraine. Uh, so if you talk to them, I mean, they really just see it as sort of fear-mongering and, uh, you know, trying to strong-arm Russia. If you talk to the minority that the Western media is trying to make out to be the voice of the real Russian people, then obviously they're going to say that, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin has all this coming to him. But these people are a small minority of the population. I mean, they're like this 
sort of uh, same activist demographic that you were talking about earlier in your program, like Extinction Rebellion and uh, these activists that uh, go after these issues, uh, seemingly, you know, uh, some sort of tr looking like some sort of opposition, but really carrying out the agenda of the status quo in that country. But obviously in Russia, they're carrying out the status quo of uh, the Western powers. They're in a small minority. We saw the um, protests that happened in Russia right after the uh, Russian military operation began. They were significantly smaller than most protests we had seen in the past in Russia, R remarkably smaller than the protests we saw against COVID restrictions in Russia back when that was uh, the main issue of the day. So, you know, this kind of stuff is just Russians really see it in the media and they don't I don't really pay so much attention to it anymore, I would say. It's just uh, kind of babbling from Western leaders at this point. Yeah, it's a very good point uh, you make. And indeed, we both made, perhaps we stumbled onto it, the difference between form and content. The form of extinction, rebellion, and so on looks uh, hyper-radical, uh, looks yeah. uh, very militant. Uh, it has a militant form, but its content serves the interests of the powers who may indeed have uh, uh, supported covertly or overtly uh, many of these campaigning groups uh, in the past and maybe even now. What can uh, we look forward to, if that's the word, uh, next weekend? In, in Washington today, there's a big rage against the war machine in London on Saturday, uh, ditto. Uh, the anniversary of the war, you call it a special military operation, I call it a war. Uh, uh, the anniversary of the war will, uh, according to Putin, um, be noteworthy, as it were, on both sides. In other words, that Russia has some moves up its sleeve. Uh, of course, neither of us knows the Kremlin's mind, but give us some of the speculation about what those uh, moves might be? Well, I can definitely talk a lot about that because um, I also work at Russia Today and uh, I'm one of the presidential journalists there. So I'm really following very closely what Vladimir Putin is doing, what kind of meetings he's having. having. And recently there was actually a pretty, um, a, a pretty uh, short meeting, but informative meeting between Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko and obviously Russian President Vladimir Putin, they met here in Moscow. And one of the main things they focused on was the, um, the fact that, well, the effects that all of these Western sanctions have had on relations between the two countries, specifically economic relations. And Lukashenko talked about how uh, the exodus of Western companies after Western sanctions were put on Belarus actually helped the state there get better control over the national economy. And it actually helped it. Um, it, it, it didn't actually hurt the economy very much. It just caused the, the government to use import substitution favoring Russia to replace all of these Western companies with Russian alternatives. And the main uh, industry in which that was uh, the case was probably the microchip industry. That's according to what Lukashenko said. But another thing that he said was very interesting. He said that now Minsk is looking to produce MiG-25 fighter jets for the Russian government. This is, and he said that they had proven themselves on the battlefield uh, in in Ukraine and Donbas. And the reason why this is interesting is because I've been looking at a lot of the speculation in the Western media about an upcoming Russian spring offensive, because a lot of uh, publications are talking about that. There are some also talking about uh, a potential Ukrainian spring offensive, but there's been a lot of focus, especially in the Financial Times, which wrote an article uh, citing an, a number of anonymous Western military officials talking about the, pot the potential for a Russian spring offensive. And they said that this potential offensive would heavily focus on air superiority. Because of, it, because of the fact that Russia is really trying to break at this point the grueling artillery stalemate that has come to uh, define the way the Ukraine conflict is uh, right now, along with the trench warfare that, that's uh, involved in it as well. So it could be that Lukashenko's promise that Belarus is going to be producing MiG-25s for Russia, that could be part of 
um, a spring offensive that we're going to see around the anniversary of uh, Russia's special military operation. And I, I remember you said you call it a war. I call it a special military operation. Uh, just to be clear, I also consider what's going on here a war. But I consider uh, the special military operation to have begun in uh, 2022. But of course, George, you know as well as I do, and um, I'll just say it again for our viewers, I mean, this, this war has been really going on since 2014 when the West and NATO and the EU and the United States backed uh, neo-fascist coup d'etat of the democratically elected government in Ukraine. And that is really what, uh, in my opinion, was the, was the main uh, beginning of this conflict. Because it's after that that Ukraine launched its so-called anti-terrorist operation when Lugansk and Donetsk said, we don't want to be part of this uh, neo-fascist junta and we want to be independent, and they said it was their constitutional right, and Kiev reacted with invading them. <laughs> so that's when the war really began, as, uh, as I see it, and that's also Indeed, how and, Russia... Uh, your, uh, your documentary film, Eight Years Before, tells that story absolutely brilliantly. Everyone uh, should watch it. Um, as you mentioned, Belarus, what about the speculation uh, that uh, Russia and Belarus will will come together as uh, that Belarus will become part of the Russian Federation. Do you discount that? It seems you do, or you would have mentioned it. Well, I, uh, I think it's hard to imagine because it's a big uh, step. And also the fact that Lukashenko recently said that he would not get involved in the, um, uh, that Belarus would not get involved in the Ukraine conflict unless Ukraine attacked it directly. Uh, leads me to believe that if Belarus and Russia were to, uh, you know, become one government, then of course Belarus, Belarus would have to participate in the Ukraine conflict. So there is a lot of talk, though, between, and I also noticed this at the meeting between Putin and Lukashenko, and the kind of uh, rhetoric Lukashenko has been talking about at press conferences as well about the uh, union state between Belarus and Russia, because a lot of people don't understand or well, don't know that Russia and Belarus are, they're not obviously the same country, but they're much closer than even uh, two separate countries with an alliance. I mean, if you're a Russian citizen, you can go to Belarus without going through the border and vice versa. So they have something which in Russian is called Sayuzna Gasudarstva, a union state. So they're not the same country, but they enjoy a lot of um, uh, benefits that basically different states of the European Union enjoy, that they can, you know, move freely between borders and, uh, and the like. So it is possible that they will take that relationship further. But based on what Lukashenko said about the Ukraine conflict, I think if that's going to happen, it might happen a bit down the road. Now, you're a younger man and haven't lived through as many wars as I have, but I've got to tell you that I have never lived through a war in which so few people were calling for negotiation, calling for a ceasefire. In every war that I have lived through, that has been a kind of central demand, at least by oppositions, if not government, and by much of civil society. Uh, not this time. None of the Western leaders are at least publicly talking about the need for a ceasefire, a political settlement, uh, and uh, so on. But China is. And this coming weekend, uh, Xi Jinping, at least by the end of the month, is going to have something significant to say uh, about the war and the need to negotiate an end to it. What do you think might be in what the Chinese leadership has to say? Well, that's uh, another interesting point that's connected actually to what we we're talking about, about Belarus and Alexander Lukashenko, because uh, at a press conference before this meeting, not, not so long before the meeting he had with Putin, he mentioned that Xi Jinping had invited him to uh, Beijing in early March. And that is going to coincide with a, with a meeting that Xi Jinping is going to have with Putin in Moscow that Russia's foreign ministry described as the single most important event in bilateral relations between Russia and China of 2023. So I think he's going to say some definitely important stuff there. Uh, there's got to be some sort of 
you know, information that we don't know about being transferred, being discussed behind closed doors between these, uh, you know, uh, top leaders, because, of course, the leaders of strategic partners, Belarus, Russia, China, they're strategic partners. And so I think China is going to uh, probably come out on, you know, again, once again, on, on Russia's side in all this. And because and, and they may, may even say something about Taiwan, remember, because Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan and uh, Beijing promised that there would be some sort of retaliation for that. And of course, there's been um, military exercises uh, since then going on around Taiwan. So it's very possible there may be some sort of big announcement. Uh, who knows? Who knows what could happen? Every, every time uh, Putin says there's going to be a big announcement as well, a lot of Russians are thinking there's going to be uh, an official declaration of war or something against Ukraine. But there hasn't been yet. Maybe there could be something like that about declaring a special military operation in Taiwan. We'll have to see. Well, uh, that would certainly uh, put the balloon up. And I'm amazed and delighted that you're on the presidential beat now. Are there any other uh, citizens of Western countries actually still working as reporters in Russia? Because, of course, there can be no Russian reporters working in Britain. They'd be arrested. Well, they're working, I think, uh, un like unofficially. But they're still here, definitely. I mean, there's uh, I've, I've seen a couple reports, uh, I think, from some Western outlets. They're, they're just working as subcontractors, I would think. But uh, officially, the main Western media outlets aren't allowed here either. But again, I mean, the reason for that is because the Russians were blocked, were banned from the West first. And this was a tit for tat response. So it's ridiculous when the Western media is constantly talking about how uh, there's no free media in Russia. I'm constantly watching uh, CNN reports to understand what they're saying in, in the Western media. And they're constantly inviting these people onto the show who are like, being described as Russian experts who are from Russia, but in Russia, they're considered extremists. And they're being basically peddled as the only sort of independent voices coming out of Russia, when of course, that's not the case. It's just the voices that they want to hear. And they don't understand that those voices are actually in the very small minority of people here in Russia. I mean, people... Uh, the, the I think they do are... understand it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think they know it. I, I was yesterday uh, somewhere, let's call it on the cusp of East and West, uh, uh, and was able, in a way I couldn't in Britain, to flick between CNN and your station, uh, Russia Today. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was basically a parallel universe. Whatever view one takes on these great events, on these wars, special operations, and so on, it cannot be healthy uh, that we have an information blockade much more powerful and strong than any iron curtain. We have a total blackout in Western countries on how things look from the other side of that wall. Quite apart from that, laying severe doubts on the claim that we live in democracies, in free countries. It's not healthy to, the populations need to have a balanced understanding of what's going on in the world, is it? Absolutely. And, you know, we're talking right now about the information blockade that was basically, you could say, put up last year after the special military operation and everything. But I've been to Donbass many times after the Euromaidan coup d'etat in 2015 and 2016, 2017. I was there. And that was when really the information blockade began because the Western media didn't want to show you anything about that actually reflected the uh, majority ideas of people who lived there because they were they they didn't want to be part of this Kiev regime anymore. Some Western media went in at the beginning, but they just consistently made hit pieces. They just went in and uh, I mean, even when I when I made this documentary eight years before, we did a part about the Night Wolves, which is a biker group that's patriotic and they helped defend the People's Republics during 
uh, the eight years that Ukraine was uh, terrorizing them before Russia's military operation. And they said that the Western media came in, they tried to make friends with them. They said, oh, we just want to do like a nice documentary about you. And then they went to the West and said, these guys are like basically Nazis. They're crazy religious people who don't like gay people. And so that eventually led to the fact that they, the People's Republic stopped allowing these people in because they were just making hit pieces about them. And um, and and uh, that's aside from the fact that the mainstream media in the West, uh, when all of the events of Euromaidan were going on, they didn't show the Russian perspective or the uh, perspective, of, perspective of the People's Republics at all either. And you know what? That's actually uh, the result of many decades of lobbying our political system. And this is part of, uh, you mentioned my documentary before, eight years before. I'm actually working on another one now called uh, Bandera in New York. And it focuses on the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States, that actually um, the, the main wave of Ukrainian diaspora came after the Soviets were successful in World War II. And they retook uh, the U Ukraine and they got all the way to Berlin. And at that point, all of these Nazi collaborators from Ukraine, from the uh, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and then the Congress of Ukrainian Nationalists, Stepan Bandera, all these people, they they ended up fleeing to the West, and Stepan Bandera even became an agent for the CIA and the and uh, uh, MI6 for British intelligence, and they fought an an insurgency against the Soviet government that was trying to rebuild the country after the you know terrible things that the Nazis did to Ukraine. They fought an insurgency against these people until the 1950s, when the KGB was finally able to. Uh, get to Stepan Bandera and assassinate him. And at that point, you know, after Stepan Bandera was killed, a lot of these, even more of these Ukrainians went to the West. And with the help of the CIA, they actually formed political organizations that have been lobbying the American government to help these people we're helping right now in Ukraine for decades. And these, there's modern organizations, uh, like uh, Razum or Right Sector USA, they have their own organization in the United States. They've been uh, lobbying U.S. politicians to give these neo-Nazi organizations in, in Ukraine money and weapons for the longest time. So this is also not something that starts uh, in 2014 per se. It's been happening for a while, but this is what this uh, new documentary is going to be about, the, Uk the fascist elements of the Ukrainian diaspora. And we're actually working with uh, some of the people that developed the, you know, super popular movie, uh, Ukraine on Fire, which was about the events of Euromaidan and how, you know, the Western narrative of all of everything that happened is not exactly, uh, it doesn't exactly correspond with reality. So uh, that that's going to be a really cool documentary we're coming out with. I'm doing some doc some interviews for this documentary in Donbass with people who uh, lived through the special military operation and the events of uh, a Euromaidan. We even uh, have someone that went undercover and did some interviews with uh, some of these people from these Ukrainian fascist organizations and got interviews with them. So it's going to be cool. Uh, we don't know when it's going to come out yet, but probably forward, this uh, year. Well, I look forward to watching it, and we'll have you back on, Donald, to talk about it when it comes out. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. This poll has gone great. When they showed me this poll, I didn't think that it would fly, but 11,631 people have voted, and there's still uh, more than half an hour to go. And it's still relatively close. I think myself, correctly, most people think Nord Stream will have a bigger uh, a bigger impact uh, globally, but who knows? We don't know yet how toxic uh, the East Palestine, Ohio disaster will be. But you've still got half an hour to vote. Coming up after this 60 second break, it's the Honorable Craig Murray. Don't miss it. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. 
as vicious as the Twitter sphere, where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. <laughs> You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The Honorable Craig Murray was Her Majesty's ambassador in Uzbekistan until a Labour government dismissed him for, as I said earlier, and I quote, over focusing on human rights. He's been over focusing on them ever since the human rights of all kinds of people around the world. He is an activist, a writer, a blogger of the very first rank. That's why they try so hard to close him down, even at one stage throwing him behind bars. But vindicated, of course, he was and is, and is now in possession of some quite explosive material. We'll ask him about it, shan't we? It is. Craig Murray, welcome, uh, sir, back onto the show. Um, let's talk about that first and then the bigger picture uh, of the new uh, First Minister in Scotland that uh, will shortly be emerging. Um, the SNP Defence Secretary or Defence Spokesman, how, should, how can I put this kindly, is a hyper NATO fanatic, a man who hates Russia and its present government, a man who is fanatically pro-Zelensky and Ukraine. How did he end up, as it were, posting the keys to his emails through what he calls a Russian letterbox of some kind? What, can you shed any light on that? Yeah, I mean, it really does seem to be quite remarkable because the man is, um, uh, you know, the hawk's hawk. He, he, he's um, absolutely in favour of the uh, British armed forces. He likes to dress up occasionally in British military uniform as um, <laughs> some kind of reservist. Uh, he's um, uh, absolutely uh, in favour of everything security services does and absolutely in favour of British foreign policy, which... You know, to me, as a Scottish independent supporter, makes him a very unlikely member of the Scottish National Party. But um, he uh, he seems to have fallen for a phishing scam uh, that a twelve-year-old would not fall for. You know, he was actually sent an email purporting to come from somebody he knows, uh, and you opened the email and it asked you to click on a link, and then the link asked you to enter your email address and password. And I, mean, I don't know anybody who would fall for that. I know absolutely nobody uh, who would fall for that. Um, and uh, he claims it was the Russians because obviously, you know, only the Russian state could be fiendishly full of masterminds who could invent that kind of sophisticated <laughs> hacking operation, as he's called it. Um, whereas uh, I don't think there's any... Uh, evidence it's um, uh, got anything, to my knowledge, to do with Russia at all. Um, but it, it it really is... Um, I, I doubt the Russians have ever heard of him, Greg. I doubt the Russians Sorry, have George, ever yeah. heard of him. Or uh, Yeah, I'm saying I doubt the Russians have ever heard of him uh, or <laughs> would be particularly interested in his emails. 
But I am definitely interested in his emails. And I know a few people uh, who would be equally interested. Um, some of them pro-independence like you, uh, some of them against it like me. Um, you, of course, who else? Nobody else would have the courage to declare so other than you. You've come by these emails. You had nothing to do, of course, with the fishing e expedition, uh, and you uh, had no uh, connection to any operation that there may or may not have been, but you had the good sense to know who might have these emails. So what are you going to do with them? Yeah, well, at the moment, um, we're going through an editing process. We've taken legal advice. And another part of the story, of course, is that I announced that I had the emails and would be uh, publishing some of them in the interest of journalism. Um, and within three hours, the police were at my, at my door of the house, uh, demanding to come and speak wow. to me and, and warn me against publishing these emails. And that's quite extraordinary, because certainly here in Scotland, you know, if, if you have a burglar break into your house, the chances of get a, getting a policeman in, in three months, let alone three, three hours, are almost nil. And yet, you know, we have the flying squad charging around here, two senior plainclothes detectives, and I haven't done anything yet <laughs> to, to warn me against thinking about a crime. Um, you know, uh, which is a remarkable new service by the by the police. Um, so uh, so we are taking it um, uh, carefully. We've taken legal advice on what can be published in the public interest and what can't be, and we're we're going through and carefully um, editing uh, to make sure that you know it, it's legally watertight in terms of public interest. Um, journalism. So that, that's going to take a, a, a few more days yet. But um, I can say that basically, it is as you would expect, you know, th this is a NATO hawk continually uh, in touch with NATO, continually uh, in touch with people close to the security services, to, to continually in touch with people close to things like the integrity initiative. Uh, and, and this is you know, another example um, of how the uh, the state plays out, acting through people pretending to be uh, opposition people, um, and and I think the um, you know there's a good parallel there with the Paul Mason uh, emails, for example, that were that, that were linked. Yes, it's about form and content that I was just discussing actually with Donald Cortar uh, in in Moscow as it happens. An American uh, journalist. Um, I'm not interested in McDonald's views on NATO and Russia and, and, and the rest because I, I already know uh, the kind of piece of work that he is. I'm interested most particularly, although a political opponent of mine, I'm, I'm a great admirer of Alex Salmond. I uh, worked with him in Parliament for decades. I consider that he was the victim of a potentially catastrophic, fatal uh, um, attack, uh, injustice, which could have seen him die behind bars. Uh, I'm interested if there's anything in the emails that might take me closer to the truth of who framed Alex Salmond. Are you able to indicate if there's anything at all of that nature? Um, not that we found at the moment. Uh, and there's a huge amount of material to go to go through. Um, and there's no smoking gun on the salmon conspiracy um, at the minute. I mean, I think I think we uh, we all know. Well, we all do. I, I definitely know. I think mo most people realize that the plot to lay false charges and make false accusations against Alex Salmond was organized from the office of Nicola Sturgeon and from the office in SNP headquarters of her her husband, uh, Peter Morell. Um, so, but, and there was enough evidence of that in court, uh, w which made it perfectly plain what had happened, which the media chose not to publish. Um, uh, but uh, we there's nothing I... Uh, nothing I'm aware of so far, 
uh, that goes to the heart of this in, in the McDonald material. But we're still, I, I mean, we've by no means been through it all yet. Well, uh, I hope you uh, can find something because this has been kicked into the longest of long grass. Uh, Alex Salmond was framed. He was falsely accused. He was acquitted by a majority woman jury, the kind of jury that the SNP government would like to, or at least said they would like to, abolish for uh, trials such as Alex Salmond's. Uh, but at the moment, we don't know who did it. I mean, we all kind of know, we all kind of suspect, but where's the accountability would be the point that I would make. But let's not go further on to that thin legal ice. Let me take you to the surprise resignation uh, of Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, at least it was a surprise to me. Was it one to you? Um, the, the timing of it certainly was a surprise. Uh, I, I mean, it seemed like she was coming to uh, the end of her tether over the last few weeks. She seemed to have boxed herself in on an independence referendum and had nowhere to go. She'd made a fool of herself over her, um, her gender recognition uh, reform bill um, and was being you know, openly mocked, really, by journalists in press conferences. So uh, she seemed to be in quite a sticky place. Um, but the timing, uh, I think, took everyone by, by surprise. I really didn't see it coming quite that quickly. No, I, uh, again, I agreed with Salmond in what he said about this gender uh, recognition uh, issue it seems an odd priority for a nationalist government, which by definition you would think had as its principal task the rallying of the widest possible part of the nation for uh, the independence cause rather than going down alleys and avenues that were much more likely to divide the population and distract the population. But in Ian McWhorter's rather definitive piece uh, in The Spectator this evening, in which he states that, uh, that it was the Green Party that were to blame for leading the SNP down this alleyway, and that the Green SNP coalition will be lucky to survive the week. Is that how you see it? I think um, if the SNP aren't going to continue to pursue the gender recognition reform, then then the coalition wouldn't last. I would say, um, I think Nicola Sturgeon had an intense personal uh, commitment to it. Um, there was a rather extraordinary thing that happened a couple of years ago when um, a couple of, uh, I think about six trans activists um, quit the SNP because they felt it wasn't being pursued strongly enough. And she made uh, this YouTube video appealing to them to come back, um, uh, which was very, very strange for a party leader. Um, so I, I do think, I, I don't think you should underestimate how strongly she was committed. I should say, um, personally, I have no difficulty with, with, with trans rights. I'm a live and let live sort of person. And I I think the principle of self-ID makes perfect sense. But to take it to the extreme of saying that rapists should be able to, to self-ID as female after having committed rape um, and then go into women's prisons, and, and, and that, that kind of, frankly, mad ideological stance, um, um, how, how she got into that position, I, I, I will never quite understand. Um, and you had amendments specifically on that, uh, but proposed by members of her own party saying, well, yes, this is all fine, but it shouldn't apply to sexual offenders, um, which she had voted down on a D-line whip. So uh, I, I don't think you should underestimate her personal commitment. It wasn't just for Greens. It was the Greens and Nicola Sturgeon, who for some reason became ideologically obsessed to an unreasonable degree. And, 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 as you said, and as Alex said, 
um, she appears totally to have lost sight of the goal of independence. Um, these things can be sorted after independence. Finally, who's your money on? I know you're not a betting man, Craig, but if you were, uh, who would your money be on to come top of the heap in the forthcoming SNP leadership election? Well, I, I think unfortunately, and very unfortunately, we'll probably end up with um, Angus Robertson, who is um, as popular with MI5 and the British Army as uh, Stuart MacDonald is. And uh, uh, I... I, I I'm afraid I, I don't think we're going to see the security services letting letting go their grip on the SNP anytime soon. Craig Murray, thanks as always for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. What an excellent fellow he is. Uh, 11,631 people have voted and narrowly, relatively, they consider the Nord Stream 2 the greater environmental disaster of the two, East Palestine, Ohio, and Nord Stream 2. The one thing I think everyone could agree on is that put together, they constitute a crime against the earth itself. Uh, Anne Tinsley on YouTube says, George, I'm trying to call you from the west of Ireland, but I'm getting a reply from my phone supplier that I am barred from dialing your number. <laughs> Has anyone else had this experience? Please, if you're in the audience and you've had that experience, that would be a novel way of trying to <laughs> hobble the mother of all talk shows. Lots of Super Chat donations are coming in. Thank you for that. Hammy Rami gives two pounds. Your coffee money, accept it, please. Thanks, Hammy. And Richard White gives US dollars nineteen ninety nine. Please, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. I'm almost at a quarter of a million subscribers. Follow me on Facebook, where I'm almost at three quarters of a million followers. Follow me on Twitter, where you can add to the number of my Twitter followers, approaching 450,000, but you'll never see hardly any of my tweets, but that is another matter. And of course, if you really, really like me, support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Gerard White gives 20 pounds. Raucous roars round Nicholas Sturgeon, reeling rueful rants, ruminating re the ruling is rarely revered. Riding roughshod, running rhino-like, on reason but rashness wrote this is still this riff is still incomplete regards gerard gerard i like performing for you for 20 pounds a time kamal tanis gives 6.99 canadian dollars jordan kaiser two american dollars sailing prepper dark secrets gives five american dollars a call for a protest against the united states putting military bases or weapons in the Philippines. How things have come round. One of my earliest campaigns was against the Subic, American Subic uh, Naval Base and the American Clark Air Base in the Philippines. And we finally, after the overthrow uh, of, uh, of uh, Marcos dictatorship, saw the closure of both of these facilities. And now, when the president is the son of Marcos, we've got American military bases reopening in the Philippines. What could possibly go wrong? Albert Sontag gives 10 US dollars. You are always on the winning side in the end, George, from Iraq to Ukraine, if not before. The arc of history tends towards justice. A quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. God bless you, Albert. And IRB Finian says... Nord Stream 2 was more destructive globally, but Ohio was a Chernobyl-like disaster locally. Very well put, actually. Simon in Ferrum is on the line about Ukraine. Go ahead, Simon. Oh, hi, George. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, um, you know, winning the war and the West is going to win and so on. Um, 
But there's been no talk about what might happen should Russia meet their goals, as in demilitarizing Ukraine. Um, have you got any opinion about that? As in, obviously, what we all want is peace and for everything to end. Um, sure. But uh, sure. um, I just wondered, you know, what your thoughts are of that. One of the things I just add to that was what was in the news very recently, um, which was uh, made me laugh slightly, which is that they said after the war is ended, uh, we will be supplying unlimited amounts of weapons to Ukraine. I thought, well, that would be quite interesting if actually Russia has completed its uh, task and actually uh, running Ukraine itself. I yes. they gladly uh, take all the weapons from, uh, yes. from the, U- the West. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I mean, the word oxymoron uh, springs to mind, doesn't it? Because self-evidently, Russia will not stop the war whilst the possibility exists that when it ends, Ukraine will be stuffed full of NATO weapons pointed at them. And thus, that kind of statement is an open invitation to Russia to continue the war until such an outcome becomes an impossibility. Uh, As Shakespeare said in in Julius Caesar, are we steeped in blood so far that it is bloodier to go on or to go o'er? And they seem to always be, objectively speaking, inviting Russia to continue right up to the Polish border as being the only way that you can make sure that Ukraine doesn't become a NATO military base with NATO nuclear weapons pointed at Russia. I hope it doesn't come to that, uh, Simon. I didn't want this war. I didn't expect this war. I predicted on the eve of it that there would be no such war. I've opposed the war in Ukraine since it began in 2014. Although, as Donald Corter pointed out, actually it began long before 2014. In a way, it never ended from the defeat of fascism in 1945. People have always been trying to use Ukraine against Russia. Uh, But I want the war to end. I would prefer that it ended uh, in a peaceful way, by negotiation, with a peace agreement that satisfied the needs of all the people concerned. But if you ask me if I think that such an outcome is likely, I frankly don't. I'd be lying to you if I said otherwise. Uh, it seems to me that this war will go on uh, for the next 12 months and maybe for many years after that. I think we are locked in what Orwell would recognize in 1984 as never-ending war. And that's a very, very melancholy prospect indeed. Thanks, Simon, for that great call. Michael, always worth hearing, in Seattle uh, is on the line about... UK politics. Michael, go ahead. Uh, Well, listen, George, thank you for taking my call. This is a real honor and privilege. Um, UK politics, I guess, is a general term uh, when I called into your screener. Um, In essence, uh, your analysis is just outstanding. The question is, what next or what is to be done? And since I'm kind of in the Seattle area and there's a heritage of the industrial workers of the world, And the general strike, and Seattle was successful with the general strike in 1919 until it was ruthlessly put down. Um, It it just seems to me that is a way of stopping both the war in Ukraine by a general strike and stopping everything that's going on, as well as stopping uh, locally, like the bomb trains that are going through, that has just hit like East Palestine, which you brilliantly, you know, started to discuss. So what is to be done? General strike? Well, yes. Uh, Well, of course, uh, such a thing would stop it. Uh, That's not the question. The question is, how likely is such a thing? How likely is such a thing as a general strike? How likely is such a thing as uh, a mass movement in the United States and in the UK and in France and Germany uh, in, in removing the Uh, people who are in power, who are a clear and present danger to the safety, indeed the continued existence of all of us and the 
answer to that question would be not very likely, uh, more likely in some places than others. Uh, Seattle, with its great history of the IWW, has uh, a resonance that, uh, I don't know, Alabama or Missouri does not have. Uh, the uh, streets of Glasgow are uh, redder than the streets of Theorem uh, or the streets of, uh, of Knightsbridge uh, and so on. Britain is in a different state of political consciousness uh, to France where at the drop of uh, un chapeau uh, hundreds of thousands, even millions of French workers can be brought onto the street to defend their living standards, to defend their interests. In Germany, less so, but even more crucially in Germany. So all I can do from this platform, for I have no forces at my disposal, Michael, I cannot call a general strike, I cannot uh, lead a, a, a revolution, uh, from where I'm sitting and with the force available to me, all I can do is, as well as possible, uh, lay bare the truth and fight for, uh, for its victory. Um, I'm for the truth no matter who tells it and against injustice, no matter uh, for whom and no matter against whom. Michael in Seattle, thanks for that call. Back to the YouTube comments. Uh, Michelle Sharon says, both of my grandparents were in the 8th Army as well, George. One fought at El Alamein, the other up through Italy. The one who fought in North Africa was a Dundonian like yourself. Yes, indeed, Michael. Uh, the Highland Division, part of the 8th Army, contained many, many people uh, from Dundee like me. Let's stay in Scotland and go to Jamie, although he wants to talk about Ohio. Jamie, welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Hello, George. Hi there. How are you doing? Okay? All good, by the grace of God. Go ahead, sir. Great. Yeah, it was just a little bit of irony that I noticed this evening, actually. Uh, were you aware of a film under the name of White Noise? No. So... This film, okay, the, the pretext to the film is a train carrying toxic chemicals gets into an accident and is derailed, unleashing fumes that create an airborne toxic event. The chemical spill requires everyone nearby to evacu evacuate the area and seek shelter from the crash. Last week, in an instance of life imitating art, or vice versa, a train carrying harmful chemicals derailed in the very same town used as filming location for white noise on screen crash how ironic is that george well i'm i'm gobsmacked i didn't know that and uh i'll certainly check out the film uh but to continue the filmic metaphor uh the u.s thought they could handle this catastrophe uh by saying don't look up uh that there's nothing worth looking up at Sure, it looks like a toxic mushroom cloud, but it's not that toxic, really. And all these fish that are dying in the Ohio River, all the uh, farm animals that are dying within many miles uh, of the epicenter uh, are nothing particularly to worry about. And if you're a citizen journalist trying to get people worried about it, we'll arrest you and put you in jail. And then they said, uh, don't look up and don't look along the railway line. Because if you look along the railway line in the state of Ohio and in many other states, they're not fit to let a train run across, even a train carrying chickens. Never mind a train carrying toxic chemicals, because the train uh, tracks would, would be laughable in a fourth world country. Never mind in the richest, most powerful country in the world. Last word to you, Jamie. Yes, okay, thank you, George. Uh, there was a comment, actually, uh, by the name of Ben Ratner, uh, who had a uh, crazy experience of not only having to evacuate his own home this week, but he also acted out the scenario earlier as an extra in the film. 
Ratner appeared in a scene in which Adam Driver and Gretna Gerwig's family are caught in a traffic jam with hundreds of others as they try to evacuate their towns after the train filled with toxic chemicals derailed. How bizarre. Anyway, thank you and God bless you, George. Bizarre indeed. Bizarre indeed. Thank you for that excellent uh, call. 12,388 of you voted in our poll by... uh, a relatively narrow margin. Most people think the Nord Stream was the greater of the two catastrophes, but both of these were man-made. It was uh, Joe Biden that blew up the Nord Stream, and is the opportunity cost of the waste of uh, the American people's resources that has led the crumbling infrastructure to reach the stage, at least in Ohio, where it's not safe to run a train across the state. Now, back to the Super Chats. My dear friend Liz Hill, who is the producer of Radio Kingston, who conducted an interview with me with the Pulitzer Prize winning host, Malcolm Byrne. Liz sends $100, dear George. Thanks again for appearing recently on The Long Way Around with Malcolm Byrne at Radio Kingston in New York in the U.S., who also sends his warmest wishes. Our listeners benefit greatly from your knowledge, wisdom, and insight, and we can't thank you enough. Ditto, Liz, to you and Malcolm. A wonderful show. Great interview. I hope people uh, will uh, look up and, and watch it, listen to it. J.V. Manila sends 250 Philippines pesos. As bad as I feel sorry for the residents of East Palestine, I couldn't help but feel as if this was karma for what the U.S. had done with the Nord Stream pipeline. Thank you for being the voice of truth. Thank you, J.V. in Manila. A legend's on the line. It's Norma in Bristol on Keir Starmer. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, can you check this Hi. out? Because I heard that Keir Starmer wants to ban Stop the War organization. Now, that can't be true. I mean, I put on Twitter that um, we're not living in a totalitarian state. I'm, it can't happen, that. And I wonder how much truth there was in that. But I heard there is a bit of truth. You can't ban Stop the War organization. Can you? Well, you say that, but they banned uh, no to NATO, no to war uh, from two venues, uh, both of which are now subject of uh, legal action by us. Uh, We have a venue which we're forced to announce the night before the event. In other words, next Friday night. We didn't announce it before because what happened to the first two venues uh, will uh, would undoubtedly happen again to the third and effectively we would be uh, banned from holding a public event at which two former British ambassadors two serving members of the European Parliament two former members of the British Parliament including me uh, would be banned from speaking about war. So why not? Yep. I don't know why Keir Starmer what? would want to do that, uh, Norma. After all, the organization you refer to is not particularly radical about this. They denounce Russia and so on uh, equally vehemently uh, to him. So I don't know that he would want to do that. But Starmer is determined to destroy Corbyn and Corbyn's supporters. So if he does do that, it will be as a, as a stick uh, to beat Corbyn with. Last word to you, Norma. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, it's people's right, isn't it? When we went, and I did, on to the, the um, stop the war when it was Iraq, I mean, we were all not told not to go, were we? Um, I just think that Keir no, Starmer... No, although we were told... <laughs> Yeah, but we were told, Norma, I remind you, I was one of the leaders of that organization, though I have been persona non grata with them for almost a decade. 
But when I was one of their leaders, uh, on the eve of February 15th, 2003, we were banned by the then Labour government, the late uh, Tessa Jowell was the minister responsible, we were banned from Hyde Park. And I was the one who delivered the message to the minister, Tessa Jowell, you can have a million people in Hyde Park or you can have a million people running wild in the streets of London, you decide. So they backed down and they opened the gates of Hyde Park. And lo and behold, we had not one million, but two million demonstrators in Hyde Park. Thank you, Norma, as always, for bringing the show to a close, alas. We don't have time for uh, any more. I would just like to, in the last remarks that I have time to deliver before the witching hour, to make it clear, in case there is any doubt, that speaking personally, I love the American people. I have American blood in my veins. Nothing that I have said here tonight should be taken as my evincing any hatred at all towards the American people. I earnestly pray, hope, wish, and I'm ready to fight for their liberation from the people who exploit and misuse and abuse them almost as much as they abuse the rest of us. It's all I've got uh, time for, but the good news is that I'll be back, God willing, uh, with the midweek mother of all talk shows on Wednesday at the slightly later hour of 9 p.m. UK time. Moats America! is a project waiting to happen. Moats Berlin is already underway. Germany, get used to the fact that you will have your own mother of all talk shows. How about that then, Mr. Schultz? Good night. <laughs>